Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to our conversation on uh, climate governance and green deals uh, as part of the post-COVID summit. I am Renzo Guinto. I am uh, the chief planetary health scientist of the new Sunway Center for Planetary Health uh, in Malaysia. I'm also concurrently the director of the Planetary and Global Health Program of the St. Luke's Medical Center College of Medicine in the Philippines. So I'm joining you from Southeast Asia. It's already around 7.30 p.m. Um, and I know this is a transcontinental conversation. Some of you are just waking up. Some of you are in the middle of the day. Uh, but, you know, despite the time zone differences, we all are sharing uh, some common challenges, one of which is the climate crisis. Um, and as someone coming from the Philippines, I have seen firsthand the impacts of climate change on human populations, on my patients. Um, you know, my country is uh, frequented by more than 20 typhoons each year. Unfortunately, now these typhoons are growing both in number and in severity. And of course, when these typhoons uh, do strike, we know that uh, so many aspects of our lives are being impacted. You know, agricultural systems, uh, communities being forcibly displaced, healthcare systems uh, overwhelmed with the increase in diseases uh, and injuries. And of course, right now, as we are still in the middle of a pandemic, uh, we've seen uh, firsthand how health systems can be overwhelmed by a particular shock. And we can anticipate that with a climate shock, uh, our health systems will further be uh, overwhelmed and, and disrupted. Um, and so this conversation is very important uh, to me because we need to find the solutions that will really uh, stabilize the climate so that human populations will be protected and safeguarded in the years and decades to come. And I'm very privileged to have uh, with me um, an esteemed panel of speakers who will be sharing uh, their insights on what should be the future of climate governance and green deals in the era of post-COVID-19. And so I will introduce uh, them to you uh, right now and then uh, they will be speaking in the same order that I'm be introducing them. First, joining us from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, we have Juliano Asunção, the Executive Director of the Climate Policy Initiative in Brazil. Also joining us from the United States, we have Professor John Kress, he's the Distinguished Scientist and Curator Emeritus of the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. And also with us is Maria Spiraki, a member of the European Parliament. And uh, we have another speaker, hopefully uh, he will join us uh, later on, but uh, we now have three panelists and we're very eager to hear their perspectives on what should be the future of climate governance and green deals uh, in the era of post COVID-19. So let's start with Juliano. Juliano, please, the microphone is yours. Right, thank you. Thank you, Renzo. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for joining us and for the invitation, the opportunity to, uh, to discuss these important topics with you. And when you're talking about the governance of climate challenges, uh, I think there are many elements to take, uh, to take into consideration. And, and as we move towards a, a more like an implementation phase of the climate agenda, I think it's important to combine the global outreach and coordination with some uh, national and subnational action, because um, it, it's exactly where the uh, the uh, these efforts will take place, right? So it's important to uh, to really understand in this implementation phase the dynamics of, of the uh, important sectors as well as what are the current institutions and policies that are in place in different geographies in order to, uh, to implement the agenda. So um, I'd like to exploit and take in the, uh, the food system and, and the agenda, the, the sector that is related to uh, food production and forestry, which is an important part of, of the climate agenda and, and, and an area in which 
uh, it, it is particularly important for Southeast Asia and Brazil and parts of Africa, in which these dynamics between climate change, forest deforestation and food production, they interact in a pretty uh, complex way. And, but at the same time, I, I think there are uh, a, a, a framework to, to support us to think through these issues. And, and I'm gonna uh, share some slides here. Um, so I'm not able to, to share the slides if someone from the organizations would allow me to, uh, to share some pictures here, this would be quite helpful. Yeah, but why do I get there? Um, oh, okay, great, thank you. So uh, hopefully you are uh, looking at my full screen here. What I'm talking about is this interaction uh, between food system, which is uh, this, uh, the fact that the uh, lands are at the same time producing ecosystem services, um, given the, the, the forests that are uh, in different places. And, and at the same time, in order to, uh, to produce the food uh, to feed and uh, billions of people, we need to, uh, to clear some of these lands in order to produce. Uh, and I'm, in order to exploit these dynamics between forestry and agriculture, it's important to take, in, uh, to take uh, into consideration not only the history that led us here, uh, given the, the occupation of these territories over centuries, and the current uh, set of institutions and policies that are in place in different geographies, as well as the politics, right? And especially in the case of Brazil, we learn a, a hard lesson that it's not enough to have good institutions and policies. It's important to, uh, to create a way that uh, those institutions are, and policies become less exposed to the political cycles, right? And, and this is something that we, uh, I'd like to explore here in a, in a few minutes. But before coming to Brazil, let me start with a, uh, a description of the evolution of food production worldwide. And, and this is data from the FAO in which the, the graph on the left uh, depicts the evolution of agriculture production uh, worldwide from 1961 and up to 2016. And you see that nothing um, you know, very exciting has happened during this period besides the fact that we've been able to, uh, to implement this, uh, uh, this in, in increasing uh, this constant growth in, in, in food production, but nothing very excited is happening on the graph on the left. But on, 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 on the other side, on the other graph on your right, in which we decompose the evolution of food production in these two different margins. So you can increase food production, uh, exploiting, you know, keeping the productivity constant and, and increasing the area on the, on the horizontal axis or you can increase agri agricultural production, you know, for a given area, improving yields in the vertical axis. What you'll see is that uh, the world has uh, implemented the, the increasing in, in agricultural production from 1961 up to 2001, combining air expansion, which might be associated with deforestation, with productivity gains, you know, from 1961 up to 2001. From in the last 20 years and or uh, since 2001, something, uh, you know, a combination of things has happened and the world as a, uh, as a player has managed to increase its production based solely on, on productivity gains. So uh, what we'll see is that the idea of producing more in existing cleared land is, is more than a theoretical possibility, it's something that is happening at the global scale um, in the last 20 years, right? So uh, technology here is a key aspect. And when I say technology, it's not only the, the innovation that is needed, but also the dissemination of best practice in a way that we can better manage the uh, natural resources you know, worldwide, in particular for, uh, for the sector of food production is particularly important because uh, as we disseminate better practice and we better exploit uh, the natural resources that are available, we can tackle climate change while uh, 
increasing our agriculture production, right? So this is a, a, a framing that, that, uh, that allows us to, to think through these issues in a more productive way, especially when you're talking about um, developing countries in which a, these uh, development challenges are, are, are so present. But the development challenges are more associated with uh, inefficiencies rather than only a true trade-off between food, product, food production and, and, and deforestation. So this is a, a, a starting point and something to, to, uh, to bear in mind when you know, we're thinking about you know, the governance of climate changes and, and, and deforestation in particular, right? So um, if we go to Brazil, and, and this is a graph that depicts the, uh, the current land use in Brazil. And this is a stylized you know, bar graph in which uh, we show that on the one hand, Brazil has a substantial part of its area in the, uh, the form of forests, right? And basically, and here is, you're talking about primarily in the Amazon, um, rainforest, but also some other parts of the country in which you have uh, important natural vegetation as well. Uh, all of the crop production in Brazil happens in an area that is equivalent to 9% of the, of the territory. And what's key for the understanding the, uh, the possibilities of increasing food production while keeping uh, the remaining forest stand, or even uh, talking about reforestation of, of, of some part of, of Brazil, is this area that is occupied by pasture lands, right? And, and these areas, they are uh, actually the key for the future prospect of food production in Brazil, because it's a substantial part of the territory and most of these lands, they are uh, being held in a very unproductive way, right? So when, when we discuss the uh, food production and deforestation or climate change and food security in Brazil, uh, the key things to have in mind is the, is the fact that, you know, given our history and the way that we've been occupying our territory, we end up in a situation which have a, a, huge, uh, a, a huge scope for increasing production while protecting uh, our forests, right? So um, thinking about the governance of climate issues here is how can we better align uh, the current policies and the financial flows in order to increase productivity in, in areas that are already cleared. And at the same time, taking some of the advantage of the, um, uh, of the opportunities that will uh, appear, you know, uh, when we implement this, uh, this, uh, this agenda in the country. So I'm, I'm gonna emphasize a, let me go to some uh, key issues here, some key policies that are in place that can help us to better exploit this territory, right? On, on the one hand, we have the, the policies that were uh, implemented in, during the 2000s, especially in 2004 and 2008, a set of policies that were uh, designed to deal with deforestation in the country, right? In, in 2004, Brazil has launched this system that is based on satellite imagery that improve uh, quite substantially the ability of, of law enforcement in Brazil to deal with uh, deforestation, especially in the Amazon, right? And, and what you can see from this graph is that, you know, um, coincident with the launch of this, uh, this set of policy in 2004, and then another wave of policy in 2008, there was a sharp reduction in deforestation rates, you know, from 2004 up to 2012. From 2012 onwards, we, we started to see this, you know, uh, starting this increase in deforestation again, and now deforestation is more than double in, uh, what it used to be in, in 2012, but it's still, you know, this is a very worrisome, this is terrible for the country, this is such a waste but it's still quite far away from the levels that we used to have uh, before, right? So these policies, despite the, uh, the changes in the politics and all of the attempts of the, the, the current governments to undermine the, the, the set of policies, the policies are you know, still functioning some version of it. And, and there is some resilience uh, in the bureaucracy. And, but the fact is, the fact is that you know, 
there are some policies that we can put in place, especially in a in a in a country like Brazil, in which uh, an institution institutions are are, are are not that great. Uh, the ability of law enforcement are um, is, is quite limited. We can use uh, technology and better targeting of the law enforcement in order to boost the ability of, of protecting the forest, right? And Brazil has a, a good example of that. Uh, that framework, uh, it's, it, it's more exposed to the political cycle than the EU would expect, but at the same time, it's quite effective. And, and when you, uh, if you estimate the, the cause and impact of these policies into deforestation rates, you can uh, find a significant impact of those policies on, on reduction of deforestation. At the same time, it was uh, very uh, cost effective. So um, there is, you know, this is one side of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the problem. If you move to to some other issues that I'd like to show here, and uh, you know, during the period of 2004 and 2014, what we observe in Brazil, you know, this is a period in which those policies were taking place, is is the fact that you know. Uh, this is associated with what, what I was describing before, is the fact that deforestation in Brazil was not is not associated with, uh, necessarily uh, associated with uh, food production, because, you know, the, the, the history of, of food production in Brazil is much more about translating or uh, pasture land into cropland, right? And actually, if you look at what's happened with the areas that was cleared, um, in Brazil, all of the deforested areas in the Amazon, we have something about one fourth of this area is in some form of regeneration, which shows and there are different ways of looking at, uh, at, at this statement, but it shows uh, quite clearly that, that deforestation is not a necessary condition for increasing our agriculture. And this is a period in which, you know, uh, food production in Brazil has increased and also the forest is coming back, right? We cut those trees for, uh, and then abandon those trees and the forest is coming back. And this is something that shows on the one hand, uh, deforestation in the Amazon was quite wasteful, but on the other hand, uh, it shows the potential of, uh, of the resilience of the forest, uh, especially uh, to, uh, to a, an agenda of forest restoration, which might be uh, a, an important uh, thing here. So this is a second element, right, on, 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 on the, um, the agenda. The, the third element that I think it's quite interesting is that when you're thinking about the, the, the global challenge of, of climate change, we need to think not only in terms of the policies that are in place, but also in terms of the financial flows. So it's important to understand what, what's the role of financial flows uh, uh, in this agenda, right? And, and again, looking at the impact of financial flows in Brazil, and in particular, the impact of rural credit on, on deforestation, when we look at the, the system as a whole and what, what, is the, what does it mean for a given municipality to have uh, more access to rural credit, you know, on the one hand, it could uh, in, increase or decrease deforestation, right? Depending on how the, uh, the, uh, these funds, they are used. And given the inefficiencies that, that I was uh, mentioning in the beginning, on what's happening in Brazil, at least, and you took at the system as a whole, is that those municipalities which has more access to, to capital, more access to, to credit, they, they not only increase their production and their productivity, but they do it in a, such a way that reduces the pressure for deforestation. So this is another element that shows that, you know, sometimes uh, these farmers, they, they expand their production uh, and, uh, through deforestation, not only because the, this is the best way of, of, of doing so, but because they don't have the in, enough capital in order to intensify and to better exploit the areas that they, that they have in hand, right? So uh, when you look at the expansion of the rural credit in Brazil, the, the overall picture is the one that, you know, it's, it has been increasing productivity, it, uh, it has increasing uh, production in a way that reduces the pressure of deforestation. If you run these uh, this estimates in, in particular uh, uh, areas, you find you, you might find some different uh, results. So if you are getting closer to Amazon, um, the additional credit has uh, increased deforestation. 
uh, when you're talking about large farmers, we also have uh, a connection between you know, credit and deforestation. But for the system as a whole, I think this, uh, this evidence shows that you know, it's, it's important and it, and it is possible to better align the financial flows with this, the climate agenda, right? Taking here agriculture in Brazil as a, as a key example. And the final um, thing that I'd like to point out, and I'm going to stop afterwards, is the fact that, you know, especially in the developing countries, uh, lack of infrastructure is something that is it, it's quite important, right? And, and most of these, the areas in, in Brazil, in particular in the Amazon, they are quite isolated uh, and the access to market is pretty limited. So uh, it's uh, the infrastructure agenda is, is something that is, uh, is, is quite important. But the thing is that, uh, you know, infrastructure has been uh, historically associated with a lot of deforestation. So when you're talking about, when you're talking about, uh, you know, post-COVID kind of recovery, green recovery, it's important to take, in, to take into consideration the fact that you know, some infrastructure might uh, have a, a collateral impact on, on, on the dynamics, on land dynamics, and particularly the deforestation, and we need to develop some safeguards. To that and, and in particular we need to understand you know for each project what's the influence area of each project what are the risks that those projects can impose on deforestation as well as the benefit the economic and social benefits it, it, it's created and there is a a long uh, agenda to be developed especially in the developing world about how to better uh, assess the, the social and environmental impacts of, of, of infrastructure, infrastructure projects. And, and this is something that is, uh, is quite important for the agenda as well. So I, I, I'm gonna close here. I would say that, you know, when we're talking about climate governance and, and, and the challenges ahead, especially uh, regarding food production and, and deforestation, it's important to, to combine this global outreach with some uh, national and some national um, context in which you know the interaction of policies and and, and financial systems are, uh, are are quite important and and taking Brazil as example, I think that on the one hand it, there is a, a clear uh, way to better exploit the natural resources in order to combine development economic development with with the climate change. But we need to do some homework in order to take the, 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 the best use of it. And I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Juliano, for that uh, very uh, insightful case study of Brazil uh, that you have just presented. And yes, we need uh, actions both at the global level, but also at the domestic level. You've shared with us what are some of the uh, instruments that we can actually uh, take advantage of. And later on, we can uh, dig deeper into these uh, you know, alignment that needs to happen at the at the national level uh, during the conversation. Thank you, Juliano. Now, uh, let's hear uh, some perspectives from John Kress. So, John, uh, please take it away. John, you're unmuted. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to get access to the screen. Uh, yes. Juliana, thank you for that interesting perspective on Brazil. I've traveled quite a bit in the Amazon and have seen what's happening. And I feel a little bit more encouraged after your presentation that things are maybe a bit more under control than I thought they were. Uh, I'm going to give a bit different perspective, a more general perspective on what's happening in the world in terms of the things that we're seeing as some of the major problems today. Uh, and I'm going to give it from, let me get my screen up here. Let's see, share this. And I'm going to give this perspective as an ecologist, not as a politician, not a, even an economist. Um, I do work for the federal government, but I work for the federal government as a scientist. So I'm going to talk about where I see the world going today and how it's kind of gotten here in terms of some of the major problems that we're seeing. And my talk is entitled Nature, the Natural World, and Human Nature, which all combine uh, together to kind of affect how we are going to move forward in the post-COVID era. So if I could start out, I'd like to, again, give a biological perspective. When we look at all this diversity that's 
just a slice is up on the screen here. Scientists and conservationists have always thought of quantifying the diversity of nature uh, in terms of species numbers. So we count the numbers of species in the Amazon. We count the number of species in North America. We count the number of species in Ukraine and we compare their biodiversity in, in this way. But that's not all there is in terms of understanding uh, nature by any means. Each one of these species on this uh, montage here is also made up of hundreds of traits, whether they're physical traits, whether they're biochemical traits, whether they're genetic traits, and all those traits also add to uh, the diversity of life. And then finally, all of these species are interacting with each other. None of them live in their ecosystems or their natural habitats or their unnatural habitats in isolation from the others. Now, not all these species are interacting with each other at once, but the combination of species numbers, the traits that these species have or the characteristics, and primarily the interactions that they have uh, in their natural uh, environments, all adds up to what I prefer to think of not as the diversity of nature, or the diversity of life, but the complexity of life. And as biologists, we're always trying to understand this complexity so we can understand how to conserve it. And also, as Giuliano said, how to restore it which in 2022 may be more important. Uh, but the big question, and again, we just saw some figures on how things are changing, is what is happening to these natural systems? Well, <laughs> to go back to the Amazon, agriculture is uh, having a, a, a big impact on natural environments. This is a soybean plantation. Uh, and if we can keep this under control, and I hope we can, we may be able to limit the impact on this complexity of nature. But the question is, what have humans done since a long time ago, and what are humans going to do into the future? And I think that's one of the points of this summit that we're at right now. Let's see if I can move my screen here. There we go. So I'm, I'm want to talk about the Anthropocene. I'm sure everybody on the call has heard of the Anthropocene. It's simply the egghead term for the age of humans. Uh, biologists, paleontologists like to divide the history of the earth up into different epochs and uh, time frames in which there are major global impacts of various things like asteroids hitting the planet and the demise of the dinosaurs. Uh, the Anthropocene is a new age that the earth has never experienced before. And it's one that we can maybe uh, put back to almost 50,000 years. And this is a very nice illustration of how the planet has changed over the last 50,000 years from David McCauley that he published in Science a few years ago. But you can see in the top illustration uh, the changes to the terrestrial environment all the way back from early interactions between uh, humans and large uh, uh, fauna through the domestication of plants and animals, through the Industrial Revolution, all the way up into urbanization and into the future. And without going into a lot of detail, the same sorts of major changes that we've seen on land are also happening in marine environments, from relatively pristine environments, uh, little affected by humans, all the way up to fishing or increased fishing and exploitation of resources on the seafloor, the beginnings of the use of, of finding energy sources in uh, marine environments and all the way into the future and who knows uh, what that will encounter. Oops, hold on, there we go. Uh, scientists have been arguing a bit and this has some relevance to what we're talking to here about when the Anthropocene began. Uh, when we look around us today, we say, oh, well, this has probably been going on a long time, or maybe this has only been going on uh, in a very short period of time. But some scientists put the beginning of the Anthropocene in the beginning of a major impact of uh, humans on the world back to that 50,000 years ago when humans caused the first species to go extinct on the planet with the extinction of the megafauna. Others look at the origin of farming and after hearing Giuliano's talk, we see what the impacts of farming are on natural environments uh, 11 to 12,000 years ago. 
Uh, the intermixing of the old and new worlds during the age of exploration when Europeans and others moved around the world and suddenly we saw species that had never crossed continents before crossing continents and uh, interacting. Uh, many put the beginning of the Anthropocene and the major impact of humans uh, during the Industrial Revolution from uh, 1760 all the way up to the present. And there are, are also some that look at the beginning of the Anthropocene as July 10th, uh, 1945, when the first atomic bomb was uh, exploded and left an indelible signal across the planet that humans uh, were here and were having an impact. In many ways, it doesn't matter when the Anthropocene started. It matters much more what is happening to the planet because of the impacts of one species namely us. Today, three of the major issues that we're encountering are one, a warming planet, and we'll talk more about that. Two, a global pandemic, which may be coming under control, which may not be coming under control. And three, as we've just seen over the last number of months, even more increased in spreading human conflict around the world. Uh, all of these things have major impacts on our economies and our politics, our education system, our ability to travel, and primarily on what's happening to the natural world. And that's, of course, as a biologist, is one of my main concerns. Now, just to take a few more minutes, I'd like to say, well, what really is the Anthropocene? I listed a few things there, pandemics, global warming, uh, human conflict, but we should not think of the Anthropocene and the impacts of humans as simply one, hold on a second, there we go. As simply one thing, one, one area of impact on the planet that had not been seen before humans became so predominant. So these are uh, some that I think are important right now. First of all, the degradation and destruction of natural habitats except for the appearance of a asteroid or a comet or something hitting the planet, we have not seen, or even millions of years ago, uh, the spreading of uh, glaciers, we have not seen the degradation and destruction of nat natural habitats, at least over the last 50,000 years as we're, as we're seeing today. We also have not seen the exploitation of species, whether it's timber trees uh, in the Pacific Northwest here, whether it's medicinal plants in Southeast Asia, whatever, the exploitation of species has increased exponentially over the last 50,000 years. Pollution of air, land, and sea. And I'm not just talking about CO2 pollution. I'm also talking about plastics, all other kinds of things that are having a major impact on natural environments. Climate change, we'll hear a lot about that during this uh, summit. I won't go into a lot of that. And that is a major aspect right now that actually is going to affect all kinds of things, including some of the issues I just mentioned earlier. Invasive species. Every one of you that's listening to this has some invasive species in their garden or outside on the city streets uh, where they walk. Urbanization. We estimate by 2050, perhaps 60 to 75 percent of the human population will be in urban environments. That will have a major impact maybe a positive impact on natural habitats. We don't know about that yet. And then finally, the spread of diseases, both in human populations, but also in non-human populations and pandemics as we're seeing right now. And I think most of us understand that once we get COVID-19 under control, that will not be the last pandemic that we're going to uh, experience for quite a number of reasons. So that's really what the Anthropocene is, the age of humans really is in terms of impact on the planet and particularly on, on nature. Come on, there we go. Now, why did it happen? And this maybe gets to a bit more philosophical uh, presentation, a bit more controversial. And these are reasons why I think the Anthropocene has happened, these changes. And, and I'd say maybe we really should be looking at the last 10,000 years and maybe only three or four hundred years. Uh, my feeling is that perhaps there are too many people on the planet at present and not enough resources to go around, which leads to a lot of the issues that we'll be talking about. Primarily also, if we were good at a sustainable use of natural resources, we might be able to have growing populations that would not affect nature too much, but we're not very good at the sustainable use 
of these natural resources, whether it's trees or whether it's fossil fuels or whatever. Um, and we are not good at all at the equal use and distribution of these resources among populations, uh, among countries, among continents uh, across the planet. The last two are the ones that I'm most interested in, and this has to do with uh, human nature. I think over the last 10,000 years, and maybe over the last couple hundred years, we really do not understand our relationship to nature. We have lost contact. You look at an urban environment like New York City here, we many of, of the inhabitants of the planet, human inhabitants, have really lost contact with nature in any meaningful way. And losing contact with nature, we also appear to be lacking respect for nature and the natural resources that help us exist as a species. What to remember about the Anthropocene, I'd like to come to a close here and we can talk about some of these things if, if you're interested. Some of the messages that I see as a scientist, as an ecologist, as a conservation biologist, and as a citizen of this planet and someone interested in, very much interested in the natural world, that over the last 10,000 years, and I didn't mention this, that have allowed the domestication of plants and animals and the development of agriculture and such things, we've had a very steady climate. Before that, there were glaciers, temperatures were going up and down, uh, but this last 10,000, 10 to 12,000 years, we've had a very steady temperature, a very steady climate, very steady level of CO2 in the atmosphere, but the planet is now in a rapid state of change or a state of rapid change. And that is going to affect everything that goes forward. Uh, secondly, we have to recognize that the linkages between our actions as a species, as one species on the planet, and the environmental changes that we are witnessing, that these linkages are strong and they're inextricably entwined. And we're gonna to have to change and seriously look at all those linkages. Third, I'd like to actually emphasize that no matter what we do now, our lifestyles are going to change. In my mind, there's no question about that. We cannot maintain the same types of lifestyles we've had over the last hundreds of years. Uh, things are gonna to have to change across the planet. Some are talking about leaving the planet. If that's not a lifestyle change, I don't know what is, but we are going to have to change how we function on the planet. And finally, and I think this is clear to most everyone, we should act in haste if we are at all going to slow down global decline or global change in the future. There are some things that we've already put in process that will definitely uh, go on and we can't change that now with the amount of pollution, with the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, with the increasing temperatures, with the degradation of forests. We are on a trajectory that will not, I think will be very positive for the planet. Uh, we can slow it down though, if we act soon. And whether or not we can do that, I think is a big question. So I'd like to end there. This was an interesting thing. I went up to New York City to give a talk to a bunch of psychiatrists actually about human nature and the environment. And I woke up in the morning, opened my window of the hotel and there outside on the scribbled across <laughs> the building was the words Anthropocene, Google it. And I thought how appropriate that I've come all the way to New York City and being told by the population of New York City that the Anthropocene is important to all of us. So I'm gonna stop there, stop sharing my screen, and we can talk more about some of these issues. Thank you very much, John, for uh, giving us the, uh, the broad picture, you know, of the challenges that we're facing uh, in the epoch of the Anthropocene. Part of, uh, you know, our, our climate community. And, uh, you know, I dropped the word Anthropocene and they were all like, wow, what, what's that word, you know? And, mm -hmm. and I think we need to keep on telling again and again, the story of the Anthropocene and, you know, the urgency uh, with which we should be uh, addressing, approaching uh, these challenges. So later on, John, we can talk more about, you know, yep. um, how can we create, uh, you know, the, 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 the rapid change uh, that you're mentioning uh, that will counter the rapid change that is happening uh, in our environment. So thank you, John.
And now um, I'll call on uh, Maria Spiraki from the European Parliament, uh, I guess, to give some perspectives from uh, you know, the politics side. You know, we've heard a lot about the important role of politics in climate governance and in shaping new green deals. So uh, we're very excited to hear your thoughts. Maria, please, thank you. Maria, Maria, you're muted <laughs> as well. Now it's okay. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for having me and uh, thank you for having me in this very important and high level panel. Uh, allow me to introduce myself. I am now serving my second mandate in the European Parliament representing Greece, uh, uh, European People's Party. And I'm also co-chairing the Indie Group for climate, for tackling climate change and and uh, sustainable development, and uh, I have been also involved in various pieces of legislation concerning uh, energy and climate, and also for motions for resolution. For instance, it is plastics, it is sustainable chemicals, it is also the methane strategy with the West rapporteur, etc., etc. So now let's dive on the issue that you have already mentioned, and I had a lot of uh, information and uh, different perspectives from the two previous. Speakers, and if I may, I would like to ask for the organizers to facilitate me with my presentation, please, uh, by starting with the first slide. Uh, yes, which... I'm going to share the screen, your presentation. Thank you very much. Well, uh, starting with the issue of the climate change and COVID, on which I think that we have two converging crises with a joint way forward. And it is important to say that we need to join the effort. And in this regard, we have to, to, to send a, also a clear message to, to, to the, it is the first light, I would like to have the second. It is important so to say that the response to COVID-19 offer us an opportunity to rethink how can we work together to address the global crisis, the two global crises, climate change and the pandemic, simultaneously and more efficiently. And of course, we had the COVID-19 pandemic, and we had also the Russian invasion in Ukraine, and we can see the COVID-19 pandemic parallel to the Russian invasion in Ukraine, saying on the Russian invasion that it is also can see as a window of opportunity for Europe's next energy day, while COVID was the initial case on how to move fast and efficiently to the next phase. But in, in this regard, I think that we are facing a huge temptation, a political temptation, we cannot ignore it. It is a political temptation, it is a trap. It is a political temptation for governments to step back from their climate, climate ambitions at this very moment because they are struggling with soaring energy prices and it is very tempting to return to discussion and practices that are reflecting an old-fashioned approach, an old-fashioned operational manner in this very moment when technology and innovation are here with the feasible means. So we have to, to, to focus on the issue to, to straight forward and otherwise backtracking among others will be considered as a clear message for instability to the investor and of course it will create a huge damage to our people and the environment. Before going to the third slide, I would like just to go back to IPCC report by saying that the message is clear. The time for action is now and the target of having global emissions by 2030 is realistic and achievable. So let's go to slide three, which is about how shall we proceed with investing in innovation. Starting with the, the main question of our discussion, which is the governance of the energy union, which can be practically supportive to our efforts. The governance must take into consideration some very important aspects that we have to elaborate further, starting with funding. How shall we invest? By saying this, uh, according to, to, to the climate policies, these policies are judged to be operational, but not sufficiently effective over time, as only 53% of global greenhouse gas emissions are covered by direct legislation aimed to reduce them. So there is a huge margin on which we have to work upon. And at the same time, while climate-related financial flows are increasing as time goes by, they remain below the 100 billion dollars target, which has been set by 22. So it is important to work to work on how shall we invest to innovation. We have technology at our side, 
and we have to invest the huge amount of money we have available coming from MFF. It is 1.2 trillion and MFF allowed to explain it because it is Brussels jargon, it's the multi-annual financial framework coming from the, it is the, 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 the European budget, the seven years European budget 2021-2027. And we have also RRF, it is the new financial instrument we have also raised from the markets and it is the recovery and resilience facility. The case is, let's invest to the breakthrough innovation in order to tackle climate change. But the key aspect in this regard is that we have to invest heavily and we have to invest in breakthrough innovation. And going back to IPCC report, I would like just to remind that large scale technologies that aim to mitigate climate change, such as nuclear and carbon capture and storage technologies, show zero cost reductions and they are developing at a relatively slow pace. So, heavy investments, focus investments in breakthrough innovation. This is the main message. And going to slide four, I would like just to introduce something that it is complementary to the existing terminology, and it is the climate and energy citizenship. You are all familiar with the World Energy Trilemma, which is uh, which has been served the purpose of the energy policy decision support tools very well in the previous decade. But now we are facing a huge crisis and we have to work upon it in order to, to, to expand the citizenship approach, not only to the energy issue, but starting to the, to the tackling climate change issue. And by saying this, I would like to say that uh, in, 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 in this regard, we have to have active societal participation in the social energy transition, which is important and entails more than public acceptance or lifestyle shifts, extends to ownership of action and related infrastructure in ways that robustly meet affordability, security of supplies and environmental consideration. And I think it is important to say that now we have to expand the term of energy citizenship into the term of climate and energy citizenship in order to promote, the, the, first of all, democratization of tackling climate change and energy issue, decentralization of production, which is the way we shift our way of life and also the establishment of active, not only energy communities, but active uh, climate change uh, tackling energy communities, ensuring that all policies concerning tackling climate change and energy policies have longer sustainability and of course leaving no one behind. And going to the, to the next slide, which is on the, on, the, on the issue of how shall we proceed with taking people on board and shall, 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 how shall we proceed with giving people the opportunity to raise awareness. It is one of the main issues raising awareness and understanding of the effects of climate change on health and this will facilitate both behavioral change and societal support for the actions needed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions which are playing a key role in, in our countries. What we need, we need target audience. We don't need something that it is, it is spreading, it is something that it is overall, and it is not something that it is focusing to some kind of audience. It is important to send a clear message to the young farmer. It is important to send the clear message to the people that now at, they are at the stage of retirement. It is also education since the day one. It is important to have citizens engaged and since they are very sensitive to, to the issues of climate change and how shall we can tackle climate change in, in, in this regard. And also we need a holistic approach. We need an approach which is engaging all of us. It is engaging the whole value chain. It is engaging the citizens, it is engaging the NGOs, it is also engaging the academia, SMEs and the industry as well, in order to engage all levels, not only for entrepreneurship, but also for citizenship. And of course, it's not easy to say, but allow me to say that uh, there are a lot of best practices in this regard. We have to evaluate and monitor the results of our efforts. And going to, 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 the, to, the, to the last, issue that we are discussing today and the main issue that we are discussing today and it is the way that we can uh, work upon the issue of, of climate governance. We need of course first of all a robust energy and climate governance framework and uh, by, by saying this it is important to establish and take advantage of a dedicated 
permanent and legally inside structure. We have a lot of examples in this regard. We have examples in, in, in France, we have examples in Sweden, we have examples in the Netherlands and also in Ireland saying that if we work in, on a specific structure, then we, have, uh, we can take the best of our efforts. And of course, examine a potential gap of a new level because we, you know that a lot of our legislation and a lot of our of our regulations and, and directives are streamlined in our member states. And of course, we have the most ambitious and allow me to say the most strict uh, environmental legislation in the globe. So it is important to provide additional assistance to the member states that they are key players to implement necessary action. And. Talking about climate governance, such a government structure can not only act as a stable and effective anchor for the overall framework to operate, but can also assume key function, such first of all gathering of information, we have the best practices for this, facilitate input from stakeholders, provision of technical expertise or track progress made, dedication of assistance to the member states, monitoring the implementation at the very early stage. And I have already mentioned the countries that they, we, uh, I, in a way, start working on the best practices, Ireland, France, Sweden and the Netherlands, and they can elaborate further on this. I would like to conclude by saying that uh, an overall key lesson draw from these good practices was that the setup of dedicated, permanent and legally enshrined structure has to be provided with the necessary means, both in terms of human and financial resources, in order to be able to properly assume and carry out its assignment functions. In that sense, the best optimal solution can be achieved. The proper and efficient implementation of the targets while provide a stable and secured investment environment in order to tackle climate change is by transforming our economy and society. And by saying this, I would like to thank you for having me. And of course, I am at your disposal to elaborate further on the issue that we have already raised. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, for uh, those uh, remarks. Uh, and it's quite interesting uh, because uh, Juliano started this panel uh, by giving us some positive examples, you know, how policies can actually lead to reduction of deforestation in Brazil, for instance. And then John somehow gave us uh, a bigger picture of the cha myriad challenges that we're facing uh, during the Anthropocene and, and the very slim window that we have in order to address these problems. And then you ended by saying that these solutions are realistic and achievable, quoting you uh, during the early part of your remarks. And you somehow gave us some uh, ingredients of the governance structure uh, that is required, uh, especially at the domestic level. You've cited uh, or you've mentioned that there are already good examples from, uh, from Europe. And uh, uh, you also uh, highlighted the importance of uh, education. Uh, and maybe later on we can uh, do a deep dive into that uh, subject. So, you know, we've already heard from Juliano, from John, from Maria, three different perspectives, uh, but somehow I can sense that they're all converging around some key messages. Uh, I would like to uh, encourage our participants to please uh, type in your questions in the Q&A box, and I will be reading them uh, to our panelists. And I guess uh, while I'm waiting for the questions from our uh, audience, uh, let me begin by asking uh, quite a, uh, a, gener a generic yet uh, provocative question, since uh, um, what I'm hearing is there's some optimism in a room, but we know that we have deadlines to meet. Uh, 2030 is a deadline for climate change. We also need to uh, we uh, address or achieve the sustainable development goals. Uh, we have a COVID crisis. Uh, John actually mentioned a while ago that there are three crises that are happening. Uh, and the way that I'll summarize it is that we have a triple C crisis of climate change, of COVID and pandemics and conflict. And we know uh, what's happening now uh, in the Ukraine. And so, um, John, you mentioned that, you know, there's a rapid uh, change that is happening in the environment, but unfortunately, our systems are not changing uh, at that uh, similar pace. So, you know, are we doing fast enough? And if no, how can we accelerate 
um, you know, climate action uh, at all levels, because what I'm hearing from all three of you uh, is that there needs to be domestic action. There also needs to be global action. Who would like to start uh, the ball rolling? Well, I can start by, first of all, being encouraged by Maria's talk in which she essentially repeated what I said, that we're going to have to understand there's major lifestyle changes that are going to be necessary, all the way down to childhood education, all the way up to corporate rethinking of how this planet is, is working. I don't think without that sort of systemic change in a lot of directions, and we didn't really talk, I didn't talk about what changes in lifestyle really meant, but some of those could be uh, extreme. And I think convincing the global population, we're all so different in many ways across all the countries that uh, it's going to take a concerted effort, whether it's in the European Union or whether it's in South America, the groups there, whether it's China and Southeast Asia, it's going to take a concerted effort. I don't know whether we can coordinate that, but somehow it would be great to set some standards on what sorts of major styles we need uh, right away. I would just like to say something. I, I'm, there was some optimism that we've heard today. I'm, I'm not that optimistic. I think that this, the world of biodiversity and human populations are going to suffer quite a bit over the next 50 or 100 years. And there may be some major catastrophes that are not in the best of anyone's interests unless we, as I said, act quick. My fossil friends, my paleontological friends here at the museum say, John, don't worry. You know, they're looking back 40 million, 100 million, 200 million years. John, don't worry, the world will be fine as soon as this one species is overwhelmed. By <laughs> but that's not going to help us in the short term by any means. So I think all of us talking and finding out some of these short-term and rapid lifestyle changes are pretty critical. Thank you, uh, John. Juliano, Maria, do you also share now uh, John's uh, semi-lack of optimism? And going back to my main question, are we, you know, you've, you've already talked about some policies both in Brazil and in Europe, but are these sufficient? Are we doing it fast enough? And if no, you know, how can we accelerate the pace of action? Who would like to come next? Oh, Maria, please, and then I'll call Juliano next. Well, uh, uh, let me say that it is it is important to to give an injection of optimism to Professor Kress. Allow me to call you, John, because it is it is important to say that uh, we are working upon on a very very ambitious legislation which is implementable, and I think that it's now time to accelerate. Of course, it's time mm -hmm. to accelerate. So, uh, when it comes to the crisis, first of all. We are faced, of course, a triple crisis. It is the crisis of the conflict, it is the crisis of COVID, it is also the crisis of, of, the, of the climate change. According to my opinion, the main crisis is the crisis of climate change. And I think that if we have to focus on the issue of how can we tackle the climate crisis. And by saying this, I think that it is time now to start working at low level, at a parallel manner, in order to explain that everything matters starting with sustainable transport, starting with sustainable clothing, for example. In Europe, we are now introducing a new piece of legislation concerning how can we avoid the way of, of fast fashion. It is an issue which is something that it is also important for, for the youngster, but it is also important for, for, the, for the whole world. We have to start uh, working on labeling, we have to start working on raising awareness how this kind of clothing is sustainable, why it's not sustainable, and how should we you, uh, work upon it in order to reduce, first of all, the, the prices and also to have some kind of clothing which are sustainable and reusable and by the end of the day recyclable. This is only a small piece of the way of living that we have to change. But we have to change everything. We have to change the way that we, we are living in our houses by starting uh, working not only for just uh, an energy upgrade, but also for a deep uh, renovation, discussing about the quality of the air that we breathe, discussing about the outside environment that we have, discussing about the way that we, we use the free spaces in our buildings. So it is important to, to say that we have to accelerate. It is important to say that we have to start from school. You have to also to, to ask the NGOs to, to, to get on board. 
NGOs, they have the credibility and also some kind mm -hmm. of resources that we don't have available. And they, they finally have the access to the to, to audience that they are not open to people like, like myself. I am a politician and I am a person with status, so nobody can hear of uh, 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 some kind of messages coming from a politician talk, talking to him that it's not important to, to buy a lot of stuff for, for consuming within a day in terms of food. We have a lot of issues with food waste. In Europe, we waste 20% of our food. So we have to, to be more careful and we have to, to understand that it is important to buy just one apple per day. But uh, it, it, it is something that it is complicated, but we have to join our forces and of course, to, to, to use all the available instruments. Internet is one of them, but it's not the only. Thank you very much, Maria. Now may I call on Juliano? Yes, thank you, Renzo. Well, let, let me echo this. Uh, I, I'm not optimistic in general. Uh, the only thing that I have in mind is that we still, the fact that we, we have been exploiting all of these resources in such an unsustainable way, this creates some room for us to, you know, in the, the short and, and medium term, to to improve a lot without changing much of our uh, of our lives. But I I agree on on the other hand I agree that you know we need to put in place substantial and systemic changes in the way that we live, in the way that we produce, in the way that we organize ourselves. And unfortunately, we if when you taking into account the uh, the recent episodes like COVID and the recent conflicts. It, it becomes clear the uh, the challenge in terms of coordination, especially when we're talking about international coordination, because you know, in the beginning of COVID, uh, there was this uh, you know uh, increasing in, in nationalism, countries you know closing and looking to each other and, and to, to itself rather than you know trying to to coordinate. If if you look at the the, the uh, inequality in, the, in in vaccination. And the supplies of, of of resources across different countries it varies quite substantially. Even when you think about the the recent conflict in Ukraine, countries they were able to implement some sanctions on Russia as long as those sanctions doesn't affect much the lifestyles of those that are involved. So um, I think the challenge to to deal with climate change in terms of international coordination uh, are, are huge. Are really huge. On, on the one, on the other hand, I think what, what to have in our favor, what is going to buy us some time in order to figure out you know, how to better organize ourselves, is the fact that we've been exploiting this world in a such you know unsustainable way that we might be able uh, to improve things on the margin, right? While we, we 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 tackle the or while the next generations arrive with you know different. Uh, ways of doing things but you know it's a it's a huge 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 challenge and, and just to, to comment on the question that uh, that, that popped up in the the q a here and uh, the question is about how to deal with the the demand for bioethanol in biofuels in terms of preventing deforestation and i think that the key for that question is that depends on where that uh, that that demand, that the supply of the, the, the bioethanol will take place in order to fulfill that demand, right? If you're talking about in the American and uh, the United States in which uh, the land use is so efficient and, you know, in the sense that, you know, in order to increase production uh, of ethanol, we need to, uh, to replace the production for other crops. Uh, this will have an impact on, on, on food prices and might have some uh, other impacts. But when we, we are talking about the developing world, and, and this can be in Brazil or in other countries, uh, there is a scope for uh, using this and the production of, of you know, sugar cane or other crops uh, in, in areas that are more unproductive. And, and I have a, a specific study in which you look at the expansion of fruit sugar cane in Mato Grosso do Sul in Brazil, in which what, what you observe is that, you know, the sugar cane production was uh, uh, taking place in pastures lands in a way that it, actually in those municipalities reduce the pressures of deforestation. So the things that we've messing up with our territories for so long, 
that we end up with this situation, which uh, we still have a, a large room for improving production without uh, uh, cutting new trees. But this will give us a, a room to, to expand that, that production. Uh, but once that room is, is fulfilled, we need to, to face the, the real trade-off, which is associated with the, the, the challenge and the issues that we've been discussing here. Thank you so much, uh, Juliana, and thanks too for uh, answering that, that question in the Q&A box. I would like to encourage uh, the other attendees of this session to please uh, keep on uh, you know, uh, inputting your questions, and I'll be reading them uh, later on uh, since um, you know, our other viewers on YouTube uh, will not be able to read the questions, so I have to actually uh, verbalize, uh, verbalize them. Um, Okay, so several of you, oh, John, you have something to add, please. Uh, well, I just wanted to say after listening to Giuliano that we shouldn't think of these crises that we're in right now as separate things by any means, whether it's climate change, whether it's pandemic, whether it's increased human conflict. I would also like to add in here the biodiversity crisis. I mean, I just sat through two weeks of the UN open-ended working group on establishing a new framework for biodiversity con conservation that was held in Geneva a few weeks ago. And these things are all absolutely intertwined and linked. They're not separate. COVID came directly out of the degradation of biodiversity in China, the urbanization of cities coming smack dab against uh, forests and transmission of diseases from animals to human populations. The conflicts today are all about fossil fuels, they're all about climate change. And so we need to think, and if we could solve one, maybe we can solve multiple things, <laughs> which would be my hope, uh, and putting some thought into how they are linked and how we can have kind of a, a stepwise process of, of solving all these problems a little bit all at the same time, I think would be helpful. Thank you, John. Um, and. I guess that leads to uh, my, my supposed next question because several of you uh, or all of you have, have talked about the need for systemic, you know, behavioral, maybe cultural change. Um, and uh, oftentimes the answer that we get, uh, you know, from whoever, you know, from different corners uh, is that we need education to, to usher that change. But, you know, we also know that, uh, you know, maybe education awareness raising uh, is, is not sufficient. We need to be more, I guess, sophisticated in the way we will uh, drive that, that behavioral change. And so, you know, for example, in terms of food consumption, uh, Maria, you were talking about, you know, clothing, right? And, and maybe that's, uh, you know, a, a concern that is more resonant uh, to communities in Europe, but you go to places where there's not even, no even clothing, right? Or, uh, you know, uh, enormous amount of clothing to, to access uh, by communities. Uh, how do we actually make sure that, uh, you know, uh, we have effective uh, strategies to usher that behavioral change, but also that is, I guess, contextual, you know, a meeting um, or, or um, you know, responding to the different contexts uh, where, um, you know, where people live. John was mentioning a while ago the diversity of cultures uh, around the world. Who, who wants to start addressing this, this question? <laughs> it's not an easy one, so <laughs> uh, I can understand. Well, uh, let, I mean, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll begin by just saying that I think the change is really gonna happen where things are worse. You know, are, are things that are suffering the most lands and people, I think that's where it's going to be unbearable to a certain extent. And I think some change will have to happen there. And hopefully that could be inspirational or as the impacts of all of these crises increase in different parts of the world, we'll all start responding to that. I'm, I'm, I'm very kind of disturbed that it probably will be in the developing countries, which are suffering more right now than the, the developed countries countries, which it should be the opposite. The developed countries should be initiating this uh, much more rapidly and, and much more systemically than the developing countries. But uh, we'll see where it goes. I mean, that's, that's just an observation. Thank you, John. Um, anyone? Maria? Juliana? Yes, Maria, I, 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 fully agree. I fully agree with Professor Press. We will suffer and that's why we have to, to become 
the, the global initiators for changing our way of living, for changing the model as it is now. And it is important to say that the EU, we have the, 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 the proper legislation, but in sometimes at the regional and local level, we are lacking on implementation. And that's why I insist on the role of education, and that's why I insist on the on the way that we have to approach different uh, different levels of people, different uh, uh, different kinds of people, in order to explain to them that it is now time to act. Otherwise, it's too late. And of course, we need a complementary action when it comes to the globe. One of the main issues that we have to, to organize further is the way that the UN is acting in this regard. Important to say that it, it, it is, it is uh, uh, less than, than, than what we need, the legislation coming from the European Union, where, when it is focusing on the, on the fast fashion, on the food waste, on the energy efficiency, on the sustainable trans transportation, etc. It is important to explain that it is something that it must work complementary with the other parts of the world. And we have to find the complementarity forms in which we can join efforts and work together. For instance, the issue of, of the food waste and how shall we avoid it and at the same time, how shall we send the, the, the part of the, of, the, of the food that uh, we are not uh, using or we are producing uh, as a surplus in the, in the EU or in other countries to the, to the countries that they are suffering. Taking into account, of course, the norms of the market, but at the same time taking into account the norms of the, of the, and the needs of the people and taking also into account the norms of the, of the planet. Because it is important to say that we, first of all, the crisis that we are is overall uh, uh, dominating the the other crisis is the climate crisis, and I fully agree with Professor Kess. But it is important to understand that there are part of this, of the crisis within the crisis of the climate crisis. We have to tackle them together and simultaneously, in a way. Thank you, Maria Juliano. Do you have additional remarks? Yes, yes. Uh, ju ju just comment and, and to put a, an, an additional uh, uh, idea into the discussion, which is this uh, this issue of leapfrogging and, and something that is associated with the the, the, the late comers, right? When I, I think it's on the one hand, it's it's kind of natural to expect that most of the action will start with the developed world. But at the same time, you know, if you think about what what people call the the environmental uh, Kuznets curve, in which you know when you're moving uh, from low income to high income, you increase the uh, uh, the impact on the environment, and then we start to decrease as we become richer. And for those who are late comers, we need to create ways and shortcuts so they can really leapfrog uh, and to avoid the uh, the uh, too much impact on, on the environment, you know, as they develop it and go straight to the uh, to the better ways of of um, living and producing and so on and so forth, right? So uh, I, I think there are some uh, there is some hope and and for those latecomers, and especially in the developing world, we need to you know uh, as we build infrastructure, as you know. We can rely more on digital solutions instead of building roles that will have a higher impact and, and so on and so forth. I think there are many examples in which uh, you can, can take advantage of these uh, latecomers and you know, try to implement leapfrogging rather than this, this complete process that, that took us, uh, that was so costly in terms of environment. Thank you, Juliana, for uh, that, that comment. And, you know, this, this idea of leapfrogging, you know, uh, uh, jumping uh, and and uh, avoiding that dirty face of, of development somehow uh, I think connects with what Maria was talking about a while ago. You know, you you said Maria breakthrough innovation and what are these innovations that will really uh, avert uh, the crisis and and we need to make sure that innovation that is for instance developed in Europe or North America is. Uh, transferred uh, to low and middle income countries at a rapid uh, scale um, in order to make sure that uh, we're able to stabilize the climate uh, on time. Uh, I have to keep on highlighting that, you know, we're, we're running out of time, right? It's not an issue that, you know, we can postpone by a year or by a decade and we're still going to be fine. <laughs> um, unfortunately, there are tipping points that we are uh, 
fastly uh, approaching. And so, um, you know, breakthrough innovation, leapfrogging uh, may be critical uh, in, you know, a green deal uh, that will need to be uh, designed. And, and because this session is about climate governance and, and green deals, um, you know, we know Europe has a green deal. Uh, the U.S. has been trying to pass its own green deal. Um, maybe low and middle income countries will need to create their own green deals. And, you know, in your remarks, I can already list down some ingredients, right, of, of a green deal uh, that you have uh, mentioned. So if you're going to advise national governments uh, or regional governments, uh, you know, similar to the European Union, for instance, ASEAN, uh, where, where I belong, uh, I belong to, uh, what perhaps will be the most critical ingredient for that domestic or regional Green Deal uh, that, that needs to be present uh, in order to really ensure the success of its and effectiveness of its implementation? Just one. If, <laughs> Maria, if please. I may, if I may, my main advice will be do not do business as usual. Stop doing business as usual. Let's focus on innovative solutions on tackling climate change and transforming our economy and society. And, and thanks, Maria. And I remember, I think it was uh, uh, attributed to Einstein. You cannot solve, you know, a problem using the same mindset that created it in the first place. It, it, it is the business as usual, man. What we have to avoid. John, uh, you I, want to add something? Yes, I like the fact that business has now come up as a topic, because we've talking more about grassroots efforts of changing style and thing. I think we also need to figure out a way. And again, I'm, a, I'm on kind of the periphery of this sort of thing, but we need to get corporate, the corporate world also thinking as citizens of the planet and not as profiteers of the planet. And I, I don't know how to do that, but we can't leave that factor out. And I think if we can somehow whether it's because of grassroots pressure on corporations, which is happening to a certain extent, but we have to change the mindset within those, within that sector of society, if we're going to have any substantial change on things. So I feel one of the of the of the maybe one of the parliaments that we can use in order to not to, to convince, but also to force in a way uh, our our industry to to look forward to to tackle climate change is by setting ambitious standards. And I think one of the roles that we are playing as co-legislators here in the European Union is this one. We are setting ambitious standards, trying to, 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 to have a role of a locomotive force in order to, to increase the ambitions of the industry, to increase the ambitions of the, of the consumers, in order to lead the way to, to, the, to the direction on tackling climate change. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Maria. Thanks, John. Juliana, do you have anything to add? Yes, I'm an economist, right? And, and as an economist, we always think about incentives and, and, and fiscal issues. And, and when you look at the different countries, I, I think we still are stuck on a series of subsidies and incentives and, and in, institutional designs that are, more, more, that are fostering uh, high carbon rather than low carbon. So I think my, my single measure will be to redesign and realign the whole set of subsidies and, and, and incentives that we have in our legislations towards this better future, right? So uh, I, I think we are in a situation which, you know, we, we, these incentives are so misaligned that we can, you know, uh, do a, a big hit just, you know, putting all of these, getting rid of the, polit you know, the, the, the politics and, and trying to realign those incentives and, and, and legislations towards the low carbon and, and, and low impact kind of uh, uh, business models and, and so on and so forth. Thank you so much, Juliana, for, for highlighting uh, the need to realign uh, our misaligned incentive system. Uh, and, and that is present or existing at the domestic level, at the global level. Um, and, um, you know, I'm looking at the Q&A box. Uh, we're not getting uh, any additional questions from, from our audience. Uh, maybe uh, they're quite convinced uh, by you uh, and your uh, statements over the past uh, hour and a half. And so I guess, uh, you know, as a concluding question, I know we're, there's so, many, so much to tackle 
uh, about but about this issue. But you know, we're around you know several months away from COP twenty seven, um, and as again, the topic that we have at hand is climate governance. Um, you know, you've already diagnosed some of the challenges uh, in climate governance, and so if you have something to um, to a, a message that you wish to convey to COP twenty seven. Uh, and an, ag an agenda item that you wish to be a uh, part of the conversation. Uh, what would that be and, and why? Hmm. Anyone? <laughs> Maria, please. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, I think engagement, engagement and engagement. Take people on board from from uh, different perspectives, I mean civil society organization, I mean uh, local and regional authorities, I mean uh, SMEs, industry stakeholders, in order to, to, to convince them to be a part of this huge project, because it, it is the project of our planet, it is the project of our life. Thank you very much, Maria. Who wants to go, come next? John? I'll, I'll say something here. I think my one suggestion would be to well, I was first thinking until I heard what Juliana said is to put the corporate lobbyists in a different building at the upcoming COP. <laughs> they had much too much influence at the meeting in uh, Scotland. But then I'm thinking, no, that's probably not right. If indeed we're gonna have a grassroots movement as outlined by Maria with a change of lifestyle and a change of education, that's the way we're going to change the incentives and change the, uh, subsidies that Juliana were talking about. So I think those lobbyists need to see that. They need to be in the room and see that and, and take heed of it and not just try to push their own agendas. Thank you, John and Juliano. Uh, the last mic is yours. Right, I, I would rely much more heavily on the financial uh, system than financial sector because they, they can have an impact at scale, given their, uh, uh, their outreach in terms of the business and so on. And they don't face the direct costs associated with the changes, right? Because they are intermediaries. And, and they have been quite open to this agenda. And so I think we can um, use the financial sector as a, a, an ally for, for this agenda. But this is something that will require um, engagement, engagement, and engagement, and engagement that Maria was uh, was suggesting here. So uh, I would put much more emphasis on financial sector as a way of improving our ability to create those incentives for uh, for business to follow. Thank you very much, Juliano, and of course, thank you to John, to Maria. Uh, for your uh, in in insights, your perspectives, uh, your uh, sense of optimism, but also the uh, need for urgency that you have uh, conveyed, uh, the examples that you've shared, uh, and the hopes that you also articulated, especially as we approach uh, the next COP. We've been negotiating for many, many decades uh, on how mm -hmm. to safeguard our planet. Maybe that's another uh, defect of the way we govern our climate, uh, and uh, and and you also enumerated some of the uh, requirements of uh, future uh, quote unquote green deals uh, that countries and regions and perhaps uh, at the global level uh, can be uh, pursued. And I'm trying to summarize it in, um, you know, four S's and you feel free to add more letter S um, in the, um, you know, uh, if, if you have something in mind, we need speed, letter S, that's the first S, we need speed. We need another S, which is synergy, synergy across sectors and also synergy across incentives. We need to do this at scale, um, but we also need some degree of sophistication. Um, in order for us to really ensure the uh, effectiveness of what we are uh, intending to do. And so feel free to add more S. Those are just some initial S's that I had in mind. But of course, uh, thank you again to John, to Juliano, to Maria, 
uh, for your contributions. Thanks to our audience for staying with us. Oh, and Juliana just added systemic. That's another S that we should be adding uh, to our uh, you know, qualities or characteristics of future uh, Green Deal. So thank you again. And I hope that we all learned a lot, but also I hope that this uh, uh, stimulates us, that's another S, to real action. Not tomorrow, but now. Thank you again and have a good day. Thanks very much. Enzo. Bye from Saloniki. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Okay.